Welcome to Introduction to Philosophy. My name is Grant Yoakum, um, and, and I'll be your instructor for this course. Um, the purpose of this video is to welcome you to the course and to go over the uh, course syllabus, which is posted to Moodle, and I emailed it to you as well. Um, so this is Introduction to Philosophy, um, Phil 101, Sections 3, CRN 32738, College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Philosophy, Summer 2017. So um, that's the course that we're talking about. Um, and the first couple of things you'll find on the syllabus are one, the correct spelling of my name. Um, you'd be surprised at the number of people that spell it incorrectly. Um, and uh, my email address, which is yokum at oakland.edu. Um, you are to email me if you have any questions, concerns, that sort of thing about the, uh, the course whatsoever. I will do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible. These are quick semesters and this is an online course. So um, frankly, I do get behind uh, given that all of you are emailing me and that's your primary way of getting a hold of me. A um, couple of things with regard to email. Um, it, like I say, I do get behind, but I'm going to do my best to, um, well, triage this and uh, be as on top of it as possible. And um, on top of that, um, it's every now and again, I get like five questions that are exactly the same. I send out, a, if that's the case, a blanket email to everyone um, in response to a question that a few of you have asked. I'm not ignor ignoring you. I'm just trying to be efficient. And so um, it, uh, I do have an office on campus, um, uh, though my office hours are by appointment only. Um, and this is because uh, you can see I'm in my lovely home office here. Uh, my home office is in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Um, so I am a commuter. Uh, this is one of the benefits to online teaching for me. Uh, it keeps the, um, the border crossings and the rather long drive from my home in Canada all the way out to Oakland University to sort of a minimum. Um, if you absolutely must meet with me, uh, my office is in MSC 642. It's sort of up one of the towers and end of the hall. Um, and uh, it's, I'd, I'd be happy by appointment with some notice to book meetings um, with you uh, in that context. But um, it, if we can sort this out by Skype, it would be probably to your benefit because, well, you're taking an online course because it likely you're not around campus as much. Um, and uh, really over the summer, I'm not around uh, on campus as much. I do have some travel booked. Um, this summer as well, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's just this is another one of the benefits of online teaching. Provided I have a hot internet connection, um, it's I'm I'm always virtually here for you um, in this respect. So um, so contact me um, before the problem becomes acute, uh, and we should be able to uh, get you through this course, um, no problem. Um, this is a pretty straightforward course this semester. Um, so it's uh, what I'm going to do is go through the syllabus, um, talk about the textbooks a little bit, talk about the structure of the course, talk about what I'm obliged to do as an instructor of uh, Gen Ed Western Civ course, um, and uh, what sort of boxes I need to fit in as I design this course, and then we'll talk about um, course policy and how this course fits into the little uh, box, uh, which is the course catalog uh, description, the Gen Ed learning outcomes and course objectives and the cross-cutting capacities. So um, it, this, is, this is basically what Oakland University demands contractually of me to be doing. So um, there are a few things in their general description of the course, a study of the main types of problems of Western philosophy. The readings are chosen to illustrate the development of Western thought from the ancient Greeks to the present. All right. So a um, couple of things from that. One, um, it's insofar as they use the word development, uh, this course needs to be a historical introduction. So we are starting at the beginning uh, with Plato's five dialogues, which chronicle um, the, sort of the life times and theory of a fellow by the name of Socrates, who is the 
uh, well, the first substantial Western philosopher that we know anything about um, in a decisive kind of way. Um, and we uh, traverse a couple of thousand years all the way up to uh, one Mr. Frederick Nietzsche, who passed away in 1900 on the button. So, you know, about 117 years ago, um, that's about 127, 30 years ago, um, is the most recent philosophy that we'll be engaging with. I've thought about updating this, but I kind of like the, the conceptual arc that I've developed for this course, and I find students respond to it too. Um, uh, now, given that this is a historical introduction and et cetera, et cetera, right, it, you may just be defying to yourself and going, ah, okay, this is going to be boring, it's going to be like a history class. Well, I've picked dialogues that, you know, have some sort of a hook that engage with issues that would be important to you and um, it, it hopefully speak to you the way that you live your life and have something to offer in the way of help about how to think about how best to live your life. So um, th that being said, um, it, this rather large pile of books I have here, um, it, these are examples of arguments, and it, it, one of the things that we're trying to get good at in this course is critically evaluating these arguments and writing clearly about ideas and concepts. All right. So um, uh, this is, uh, it, with regard to the gen ed learning outcomes, um, if we skip to the bottom there, um, it, it, of the gen ed section on the first page of your syllabus, um, it lists off things that the course is supposed to do. Um, introduce students to, uh, to the important historical texts and philosophy, and that is to know important philosophical ideas of European and American culture. So students, Texts, text students, right? So it's, you've had sort of a general introduction to them there. Um, but nonetheless, throughout the semester, we'll introduce you in a more substantive kind of way, right? And these are several of the really important big figures um, that I've selected here. Um, these are nothing but classics, right? That I've, um, it, there's nothing obscure about any of the, um, the philosophy that I've chosen to introduce you to. Second, to show students how philosophical theories have developed over time. That's why we start at the beginning. Um, we linger a bit in the ancient period. Um, we take a brief sojourn in the modern, and then we move to what's come to be known as the postmodern um, kind of period. So basically, the three major moves in the, the development of history, of, or uh, the history of ideas, uh, we're at least touching on each of them. Um, and you're going to see sort of a shift in a theory of human nature. You're going to see a shift in epistemology. You're going to, and I'm introducing terms right now that I'll unpack as we go. So, but nonetheless, you will see it's from the text and from the arguments that I've selected, the development of these ideas over time. Um, uh, what else are we supposed to do? Um, to develop the student's facility in using logic to analyze and evaluate philosophical arguments. So you will have to um, acquit yourself to this material, which is uh, by its very nature somewhat difficult. Right? Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be tricky uh, with regard to presenting this work to you, but nonetheless, um, it's important that we develop an, a capacity to engage with what is yeah, fairly difficult reading, um, fairly heady reading as well. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, you're going to see me refrain uh, through these videos throughout the course um, that, it, you know, it, we're, we're and I point out something that I, I think is clever in the way each of these theorists have argued what they're trying to argue. Right? There are some really, really interesting logical, argumentative, conceptual tricks, um, and tricks meaning uh, methodologies and um, insights uh, that these, these, these guys exclusively guys and I've got to address that as I redesign these courses but nonetheless um, that these guys actually engage with right so um, I 
pick these, which are classic works, um, it, not just because they're classics and okay, here's your intruder, but nonetheless, because there is something in them that makes them classics. There's something substantive in the argument. And even if, um, and it, this is something important to note, I don't think any one of these theorists has it right all the way. There was a meme I saw going around on Facebook not too long ago, um, you know, basically um, it, explaining in a, the structure of philosophy, right, which goes, you think things, arrow, you are wrong, arrow, you think things, and so on and so forth, right? Um, now, you might you might think, okay, it's kind of like Sisyphus pulling, pushing that rock up the hill and then it rolls down again and pushing the, but it is possible to learn something from someone who's wrong in interesting ways, right? Because it, that, that meme is sort of an oversimplification. You think things, you are wrong. You think things, you're wrong, et cetera, et cetera, right? But it's an oversimplification. You think things, you're wrong. You gain insight right, from your errors and the limitations of your own thought, and then you think better things. So, um, well, I tend to take philosophy as a discipline that's somewhat fallibilistic, right, where we are making stronger and better arguments, coming up with more rigorous and more substantive accounts of what it means to be a human being, what it means to make choices, what it means to exist in a world um, filled with things, um, et cetera, to exist within the context of a political arrangement, uh, to exist within the context of a culture. I mean, it, better is good, right? And if you look really close at the scientific method, the scientific method in the hard sciences as, it, as it's applied is fallibilistic as well. Uh, you can easily say the same sort of meme structure about science. You think things, you're wrong. You think things, uh, you investigate things, you're wrong. You investigate things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, so basically we're, it, it, refining our ability to engage in critical, rational discourse about these topics, and I'll get to the topics in a minute, that really matter to us as human beings. Uh, another way of thinking about philosophy is that um, philosophy is the set of questions that is still there, still present, still pressing once all the facts are in. Right. So the philosophy is the whole series of questions that's left over after you've done a factual analysis of something. Right. So it's not knowing that, but why and what it's good for. Right. So um, that's, that's where we're going with this. And then one last thing in the gen ed learning outcomes here to develop students, faculty, and the clear presentation of arguments in writing. So in this course, we're going to have to write. Right? Now, um, cross-cutting at capacities in addition to the Western civilization knowledge area, this also, uh, course also includes the cross-cutting capacities of effective communication and critical thinking, which was presupposed in the gen ed learning outcomes, right? Um, upon completing the course, students should be able to perform an elementary logical analysis of a philosophical argument, and they should be able to express that analysis in a short essay that demonstrates their knowledge of uh, the history of philosophy and its, rele and, and its relevance to understanding and attempting to solve current philosophical problems. So uh, not only are you going to have to read, and, and it, you, you're probably freaking out. I'm going to calm you down in a minute about all of the reading. Um, it, but on top of that, you're going to have to write and you're going to have to think. Right? And this takes time and some effort, which is going to be a bit of a challenge in sort of a shorter summer semester. So um, I've simplified things for this course somewhat. But I think we're still going to be able to write substantively, engage with this material substantively, and get you thinking in a critical and incisive kind of way throughout the structure of this course. So um, 
Next section is the textbooks. And yes, there are six, believe it or not. Um, all are required. I've tried to make them reasonably cheap. And um, I was on the Oakland Barnes & Noble kind of thing. And if you buy brand spanking new copies of all of them, it's about 108 bucks. And um, what I'm going to point out to you is that if I were to use a big glitzy honkin textbook like this, the suggested retail price, and this is this is the price that the bookstore pays, is $89.95. Right? So um, it, it can go up to $140 for one of these kinds of introduction to philosophy kind of books with the ever so weighty kind of picture of Greek statues on the cover. Um, and what you get out of those books is... Um, well, it's not Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. Well, first off, I've yet to come across a book that actually develops the arc the way that I want the arc developed. Um, it, because each of these theorists are building sort of an understanding, right, of the history of Western philosophy. Right? So what you get is somebody else's course arc when you use one of those books. Right? And on top of that, usually what you get is the smallest little fragment of the actual text from Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Hobbes, etc., 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 and an analysis sort of prepacked by somebody else. Now, if I want to know what, for example, Plato meant by platonic love, I'm going to read one of the love dialogues, right? If I want to know what Socrates meant by justice, I'm going to read the Apology and the Credo. If I want to know what Aristotle means by happiness, I'm going to read the, the Nicomachean Ethics, right? I'm going to go, if, if I am going to come to know anything about this material, it, think about it like, if, you know, either you actually watch a sitcom and see what's going on in that sitcom and you base your understanding of what's going on in the sitcom from your direct experience of that sitcom, or you play the telephone game and your cousin Susie's brother Michael watch the sitcom and relate it to these people, right? then you have developed an understanding of what's going on in the sitcom through this third or fourth hand kind of knowledge you don't really know what's going on in the sitcom. Right? So, I mean, effectively, the only way to know what the heck Socrates is talking about is to read Socrates, right? or Plato, or Aristotle, or Hobbes, etc., 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 etc. So this is why I do books the way... One, I've tried to pick fairly wide published, uh, widely published books and cheap, cheap, cheap translations of them. The first three are by a company by the name of Hackett. And uh, basically what these are are old translations that have gone off their copyright that Hackett has appropriated and packed into um, these might look old because they're well thumbed, but nonetheless, these 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 versions uh, these are good translations that you can buy fairly cheaply. And I think it, I think we're talking nine dollars, eleven dollars, and fourteen dollars or something like that for these. And you have the primary text, so that's kind of nice. Um, it, just quickly while I'm doing this. Um, it, Socrates, it's basically from um, uh, the five dialogues. There are some versions of this that actually call this the trial and death of Socrates. I don't need to give you a spoiler there, but nonetheless, um, the dialogues that we'll be taking a look at are the Apology, which is um, the most unapologetic apology you'll ever come across. It's Socrates' trial defense. Um, and the Crito, which is a dialogue um, between Socrates and his friend by the name of Crito, who's trying to get him to escape from prison to flee his execution. And uh, the dialogue is uh, centered around what ju uh, both the dialogues sort of work in tandem, centered around the question of what justice means in the context of a democracy, or what the necessary conditions of a functioning democracy are, right? Um, so I, I think at this point in history, it's important to actually read through some of these fundamental texts, because, for example, Jefferson, your, your, your Thomas Jefferson, actually 
based a lot of his arguments on a really solid reading of um, the sections of, of the Socratic dialogues right, concerning democracy. So um, it, it, that will be interesting, justice in the context of a democracy, which is um, timely and I think important to us who live in democracies with uh, is sort of a lineage that dates back to the Athenian democracy that Socrates was engaged in. Right? So what does it mean to, to, to have a democracy that is a just society? Uh, um, important topic. Um, then I've already hinted at, we turn to Plato, who was a student of Socrates. And this is confusing because you see Plato here and you see Plato there. Um, I do a thing. Um, it, these older dialogues, I tend to read them as Socratic dialogues, right? wherein Plato was just uh, reporting the thought of, of his, his, his mentor, right? um, his exemplar, maybe, right? better, uh, because you're going to see Socrates claim never to be a teacher. Right? But um, nonetheless, uh, Plato had great respect for Socrates and learned a lot from Socrates' example. Right? So um, Plato, since Socrates never wrote anything down, offered in these dialogues specifically an account of Socrates' position, which, mind you, we don't know if this position was actually Socrates' position, but nonetheless, it's wildly distinct from the one we get from the later works, for example, in the Phaedrus, um, uh, who, wherein um, the position drastically changes. So there is a hard distinction between the Socratic dialogues and Plato's own, own theory. So I call this Socrates and this Plato. So um, we turn to uh, the Phaedrus, which is one of the love dialogues. Right? Um, you've, you've, you've heard about platonic love or Joe and Susie dating. No, it's just platonic. Oh, that's too bad kind of thing. Um, well, what we're going to do is turn to a set of um, three arguments, actually, um, in the Phaedrus. We're not going through all the way through any of these books, by the way. Um, so if you're worried about, oh my gosh, this course is going to be a lot of reading over a short period of time, we're reading two of the five dialogues. We're reading 49 pages of the Phaedrus, um, which is three of the very many arguments that are contained in here. Um, uh, the, the first one is sort of recounted by Phaedrus um, from a um, orator by the name of Lysias. It's an argument about why it's better to have a casual non-love relationship than to fall in love. It's better to have casual sex than fall in love, is the first argument that's presented in the Phaedrus. The second one is, well, sort of Socrates' reformulation of that same argument. Socrates was not impressed by the structure of the argument offered by Lysias and basically argues that he can do a better job of creating an argument of that sort with his eyes closed. So he pulls his cloak over his head and with his eyes closed makes a better argument than Lysias's. Right? Now, neither of these arguments are Plato's actual position. He's just kind of strengthening the earlier argument in order to knock it down and develop his own position. Right? So the third speech, which is called Socrates' second speech in the Phaedrus, which is by Plato, I know, confusing, um, but nonetheless is uh, Plato's account of a valuable love kind of relationship, because the first two arguments criticize the lover and largely what Socrates, the character, and Plato's Phaedrus is building to is making an argument about the benefits of love and what it really means to be in a healthy, loving relationship. Right? So platonic love from Plato, right? because Wikipedia is wrong with regard to Plato. That's, that's, that's an interesting something. So um, the, how the course is structured, uh, it, we're still on the first page here. Um, uh, there are going to be three tests in this course. Right? Um, you see there are six figures that we're studying. Uh, we'll study the first two, Socrates, Plato, have a test. And then we'll study the next two, 
Aristotle and Hobbes, then we'll have a test, and then we'll study the last two, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and then we'll have a test. And that's your course, right? Um, so the first test, right, will be on these two figures, and um, the course is not comprehensive, right, kind of thing. The last test, um, it will just be on Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. The second test will just be on Aristotle and Hobbes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So um, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, Aristotle is the last of our ancient philosophers um, to, 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 that we study in this course. This is how this works. Socrates, um, who we're reading the Apology and the, um, the Crito from, um, was the mentor or exemplar of Plato. Right, who actually established the first university in the Western world called the Academy. Right, and um, Plato, while teaching at the Academy, had a, a star pupil by the name of Aristotle. Right, um, Plato's Academy right, was a great place. Taught logic, taught math, taught philosophy, um, taught all of the rudiments. Some, uh, you know, it, it, anyhow. Right. Um, it was it was a good all around. It was the first really formal educational as institution in the Western world. But uh, Plato and Aristotle had some fairly large theoretical disagreements, which we'll get into in the course. So when it became time for Plato to step down as director of the academy, he appointed somebody else, at which point Aristotle basically said, fine, I'll start my own university called the Lyceum. Um, French middle schools uh, are called Lycée um, in, in honor of Aristotle at this point. It's true in Quebec, Canada, as well as it is in France. So Aristotle um, was the student of Plato uh, who struck on, out on his own and created the second university in the Western world, the second formal education institution in the Western world. Um, and what we're getting from the Nicomachean ethics is a variety of things, right? Um, first, a note about this, um, uh, with the fall of Rome, uh, what we found is uh, that a lot of the documentation of earlier theory and philosophy and science was lost as libraries were sacked and whatnot, that sort of thing. Um, and well, Plato's works, because they were everywhere, um, really, really survived, Aristotle had a couple of disadvantages that way. Aristotle was the tutor of um, Alexander the Great, right, who you know, conquered the Western world before he, by, by the time he was your age. Right. Um, but the problem was Alexander the Great passed away and there was a big backlash against anything affiliated with um, Alexander the Great or his sort of county, uh, Mycenae, right? And uh, largely Aristotle's works were sort of purged to some extent from history. Those that survived, survived in places like the Library of Alexandria, um, which was sacked. Right. So um, effectively, for a good eight or nine hundred years, Aristotle's works were lost. Right. So we lost a major part of the puzzle of the history of Western thought. So for that period of time, the big sort of theoretical kind of work to turn to was Plato. Right until um, in an excavation, an Islamic philosopher by the name of Avicenna managed to find oh, what's essentially lecture notes from the Lyceum, right? So the Nicomachean Ethics is effectively a collection of le lecture notes from um, Aristotle's teaching uh, at his university. Right? Now, it's called the Nicomachean Ethics because it was er edited by Aristotle's son, Nicomachaeus. Right. Um, and largely the topic of the, the discussion here is um, happiness. What does it mean? Right. And this is the presumption of the dialogue. Right. Show of hands who wants to be happy. Can you not want to be happy? No, of course not. Why do you want to be happy? Well, the question doesn't even really make sense. Right. Um, now, what do you mean by happiness? Ooh. Ooh. Now, Aristotle sees 
Happiness, eudaimonia, uh, the good life as the greatest good, that which we seek for its own sake, that we never seek for the sake of something else, and which, if we had it, would be so complete and self-sufficient that we could want nothing else. Right? Well, the problem is, most of us have never actually, it's why we do everything that we do, that it's something that we never do for the sake of something else, but so few of us have pause to think in any sort of rigorous or systematic way about what happiness is. We want happiness, so we do all of this other stuff, but we're just doing stuff that has no connection to an emphatic notion of happiness. So basically what Aristotle is doing in the Nicomachean Ethics, which is a really sort of brilliant dialogue, is creating sort of a football strategy right, to basically maximize our chances of achieving as close to the good life as we can, living well. Right? So, um, so the first task in the Nicomachean Ethics is to try and come up with a general definition of happiness. Right? Now, in this dialogue, Aristotle connects happiness to virtue right, in sort of an interesting way that we'll get into. Right? And the development of virtues has to start from a really young age. So it's the Nicomachean Ethics, edited by Aristotle's son, Nicomachaeus, to give sort of a tip of the hat to the fact that this is also sort of a child-rearing manual, right? because we've got to train people to act in ways that maximize their chances of producing this greater good. Right, that is acting virtuously. Right, so from a very young age, uh, the education of young ones is going to be very important. Now, the other thing that this is, and it's sort of weird to say this, is this is maybe the first self-help book ever written in the West. What we're going to get from the Nicomachean Ethics is sort of a bootstrap method. Right? So this is this is how to maximize your. It's it's like any of those late night tel, televangelist kind of uh, buy my book and then you too can have the yacht with the girls with the bikinis and all of the other misogynistic kind of garbage. Um, well, anyhow, this is this is kind of the first version, the 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 1.0 model of that. Right. At the same time, as the title suggests, what Aristotle's going to do is try to, as we say in philosophy, ground a normative claim. Right. That is, a normative claim is a should claim. You should do this, you shouldn't do that. You should act this way, you should not act that, that way. You should choose on the basis of this, you should not choose on the basis of that. Right. What Aristotle's going to do is answer the question of why or on what basis we can say you should do this and you shouldn't do that. Right? So it's ethics at the same time. Right? So that's Aristotle. Right? And that concludes our brief sojourn in ancient philosophy. Um, it's an ancient heavy course. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Then we pop into the moderns, um, uh, Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, and um, I'm having you read like a section of this, and I've got a quick way um, to explain this. Um, this may be the most important work of political philosophy in Western history. Um, uh, believe it or not, um, I've got them right here, Empire, Multitude, and Commonwealth kind of thing. These. These three books by uh, contemporary philosophers by the name of um, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negre actually revisit Hobbes, Leviathan, and the arguments that Hobbes um, is making here. It's important stuff, and it's about sort of doing an anatomy of political power, right? Um, and bringing all this, this may be the first move into, you know, versus. Uh, these guys who did sort of political theory in the ancient sense, this may be the first move into what we might call a political science. Right? So um, this hopefully will be an interesting book for you as well. This is the power of the sovereign kind of thing. And it's, it's um, 
there's a thick theory of human nature um, that comes out of this book. And given that theory of human nature, uh, well, how can we expect human beings to act towards one another when left to their own devices? Well, given that that is uh, the nature of human beings and how human beings act when left to their own devices, what can we say about the kind of necessary political structures that need to be in place for the possibility of any sort of prosperity? Right? Um, so that is what we are going to get from Thomas Hobbes. Now, from the ancients, you're going to see a certain degree of optimism with regard to, um, to, to human nature. We're basically good creatures. Right? And the only reason we do nasty, foolish, wrong-headed, jerky kind of things is because we don't know any better. So if we become more rational, then we become uh, better people almost automatically, right, is the argument from the ancients. Um, Hobbes is not a pessimist with regard to human nature. He's more of a realist. We like pleasure and we don't like pain, right? So most of our actions come down to calculations, complicated ones to a certain extent, right, of um, appetite and aversion. We like what we like, we don't like what we don't like, so what are we going to do? We're going to gravitate towards what we like and away from what we don't like. Right? So Hobbes sees himself as a realist and tries to bring the best tools of um, the science of his day to an understanding of the sort of techniques of um, political power. Right? So that's Hobbes. Then we'll have another test. And then we end off with um, Soren Kierkegaard, who has more, um, more, more pseudonyms than I have pairs of socks. Um, we're reading two of the um, several uh, the, the several pamphlets um, from this book. Uh, first, we'll read the concept of anxiety. Um, and then we will move to sickness unto death, or is that the other way around? Anyhow, um, anxiety and despair are the topics of Kierkegaard's religious existential sort of analysis. Right? Um, he tries to uh, identify a general cultural mal malaise um, or sickness right? and address it using existential philosophy. Right? Um, he's funny. Right? He's one of the first philosophers to actually make me re laugh out loud while I was reading him. He's difficult. Right? He'll use a style of language that eh, tries to make it hard to understand it because to a certain extent, um, don't have one. Oh, what? I do. I do. This, this tends to be even in his day, the kind of way that we understand complicated ideas in terms of simple bullet points, right? Um, with tips and do the right thing kind of blurbs and stuff like that. It was these cheap little pamphlets in Kierkegaard's day that oversimplified and encouraged people to misunderstand. What Kierkegaard is trying to do is put something that is seemingly so simple that we already, yeah, 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 we understand it, right, in complicated terms to demonstrate the fact that we really don't understand it and need to think deeply about it, right? Um, this, this was an insight of Kierkegaard's that, you know, the simpler we make something, the easier it is to misunderstand. So really, what we have to do if we want to come to a deep, thick, rich understanding of any topic or, you know, exclusively the most human of the topics in Kierkegaard's terms, right, um, was to come up with a sort of a trick of thought in order to give us access to that which we sort of dogmatically assume that we already understand. Then we conclude with a guy by the name of Freddie Nietzsche, um, Frederick Nietzsche kind of thing, um, who I have a specialty in. Um, you know, we're reading a selection of one of his, his, 
his books here called Twilight of the Idols, um, or How to Philosophize with a Hammer, um, basically where he wants to do a radical critique of cultural values, right? Um, starting with those of Socrates and working up through a critique of Christian values, right? Um, now, it's important to note, right, it's all of these topics are going to um, sort of push triggers with you and uh, hot buttons and that sort of thing. Um, this is this is the thing about philosophy. We talk about all of those uncomfortable things that you're not supposed to talk about in polite conversation um, or dinner parties or that sort of thing. Um, and we are trying uh, through a conversation right, to come to a deeper, richer understanding of these topics that we generally try to avoid in our workaday lives. Right? The reason they are topics of conversation that we don't engage with at dinner parties is because, well, we get worked up about them. We get worked up about them because they're important to us. We, they're important to us because they are most generally attached to what it means to be a human being and how to live a good life and how to make choices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, the funny thing about our culture is that we avoid talking about precisely those topics that are the most important to us, right? So I'm certain that throughout this course, these theorists are going to annoy you or get you riled up or what have you, right? I'm not teaching this material because I think, like, like I said earlier, that I think any one of them has it right. I'm teaching this material, right, it, for the philosophical reason that it was written, right? To provoke a conversation about the value of value, the meaning of meaning, right? That sort of thing, in order to enliven and enrich our understanding of what it means to be a human in the world that shares that world with other humans. Right? So by talking about it and theoretically assessing right, what it means to be human along with these theorists, right, largely what we are doing is trying to drag out of you and me at the same time because I learn every is something every time I teach these courses right we're trying to basically develop and hone and sharpen our ability to answer and uh, analyze these problems and answer these questions for ourselves right so these are examples of attempts to answer questions that we will then analyze right and refine our own skills right in order to get us to more effectively think for ourselves right so that's the goal course breakdown um grades three tests um the tests are going to be um i said generally but specifically here it's going to be um six questions each worth five points each totaling 30 so it's 30 60 90 um, and uh, then there will be a discussion forum um, uh, with a topic that I'll, I'll introduce related to each of these figures. And um, it, you will engage in conversations, debate, analyses, um, that sort of thing amongst yourselves. Um, with regard to each of these theorists, I grade that at, as a participation grade at 10% of the uh, your final mark. Um, I know it doesn't seem like much, that 10%, but it's enough to turn an A into a B if you don't do it. It's enough to turn a B into an A if you rock it. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it will go. Um, the discussion forums, um, it basically, you're supposed to post at least once each for these discussion forums. I'll introduce a topic, right? For example, um, it, I don't know, what have I done in the past um, in the context of the apology? Why is, according to Socrates, voting not alone, not enough to produce justice in the context of a democracy? Right? Something along those lines. So you'll engage with this argument. Right? Of course, um, 
the topic that I present, and you'll have a little video about why I think it's an interesting topic for each of them, the topic that I present is the starting point of a conversation. The point of these forums is to create sort of a collective cooperative environment for learning. Right? What you all have in common is that you have to get through these texts and come up with arguments and an understanding of these texts and refine and hone your ability to um, talk about these abstract ideas using the written word. Right? So the forums are a good sort of avenue for this. Now, if you've got a question about some other aspect of this, uh, of the arguments that it, fair game, put that up. This is uh, the forums I consider that your workspace. This is your rough workspace where you don't have to have the answer so much as ask good questions, right? ask incisive kinds of questions. So um, basically the idea with these forums is that they should become a long sort of running conversation between you and all of the other students in the class. And like I say, I leave these forums um, as your workspace. I comment on them very, very infrequently. Um, uh, let me see. Here it is in my description on uh, page two in the evaluation section. I ask myself three questions when I assign grades to these forums. Have you posted at least once for each topic? More is better. The idea is to foster an ongoing conversation about the issues raised by the material at hand. Two. Are the posts substantial? That is, it, do the posts offered show engagement with the material? Have you thought about this material? It's really obvious to me when somebody hasn't read and um, tries to post. Well, what I think happiness is, is, you know, going to Disneyland or playing bingo or something along those lines, right? Well, that's, that's no engagement with Aristotle. Right. So um, if it's an Aristotle post, you've got to actually connect it to Aristotle right? in order for it to really count. Because And three, are the posts timely? Or did the student wait until the last minute to do them all? Right. This is the thing. Um, as soon as the Socrates forum opens, it's open right until the end of the class, right? um, which ends uh, on the 22nd of August at 11.55 p.m. That is five minutes to, to midnight. So um, it basically, you've got all semester with each of these posts, right? uh, which you, with each of these forums. Right? I do that for, well, two reasons. One, it gives you control of your grade, that 10% rate right up until the end. The other reason is um, because, um, well, largely, it, the first major section in Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols is called The Problem of Socrates. You'll find Kierkegaard referring to the Socratic notion of sin in connection to a discussion we'd had earlier. Right? Um, you'll find Hobbes has to knock his way past Aristotle's definition of happiness in order to make the argument that he has. There is a major distinction between Aristotle and um, Plato, etc., etc., etc. Right? So each of these theorists are in dialogue with one another. It's a long running conversation between these theorists. None of them are really isolated, right? So, um, so come the end of the course, you may have a really interesting insight for the Socrates form. Put it there. It's open. It's open to you, right? So, um, yeah, so those are the two reasons um, that I do that. Um, I track both, and this is the important asterisk that I've got to say, I track both responses to other people's posts and unique posts, right? So do either, do both, it doesn't matter. Um, just have a good conversation about the material. If I see substantive, timely, and engaging kind of posts, then you're going to do well on that portion of your grade. I just great, gave you my grading criteria there. Um, uh, in the policy section, you'll also find um, um, a discussion forum po content policy. The discussion board for this course is intended and should only be used for discussion of the course material, procedural questions, and general comments about the course. For example, when are we getting our grades back, or how did everybody do on that exam, should be directed to my email or should be discussed in person or office hours or between yourselves kind of thing. The point is this is an educational sort of resource. So if 
you're talking about what you did on the bloody weekend, um, become Facebook friends. You can do that, right? Uh, follow each other's Twitter feeds. Doesn't matter, right? Um, this is an educational resource. Um, second caveat with regard to the content um, on these discussion forums. Um, I'm fully aware that um, if Aristotle says happiness is X and you guys get into a debate about what happiness is, it might be rather important to you and it may actually get you bowed up and kind of crazy. Somebody's trying to tell me how I'm supposed to be happy and that sort of thing. This is good. Right? These guys are trying to tell you what to do. You should be critical. This is why the word critical shows up in the syllabus as often as it does. But maintain a certain distance from the argument. Don't attack each other. Right? So um, this is the reason I add uh, there will be a zero tolerance policy for derogatory comments or personal attacks on this forum. Posts of this nature will be removed and grade deductions will ensue. This is an instructional resource only and should be and should not be treated like um, a personal blog. Anybody blog anymore? I blog. It's weird. Um, or a more general forum like the comment section and the New York Times or something like that. Right? Um, it's not. Right, um, and you're you're governed by all of the, the the academic regulations that you find in the student handbook, right? With regard to how you interact, so if you're attacking on the basis of race or gender or just generally calling each other stupid or names or anything along those lines, that's not acceptable, right? The idea is keep it co uh, topical and keep it classy. That's what you're required to do. <coughs> Excuse me, got one of these summer things. Um, so section tests, right? Um, it, you'll have videos uh, for each of these tests. I lay them out where I discuss each of the questions and what I expect in the way of a response. The idea is these are going to be substantial questions. There'll be six of them and I'm looking for a paragraph or two in response for each of them. So it's going to be, they're fairly involved tests, right? So give yourself plenty of time. Um, I give you the weekend with the material, so one, they're essentially open book. Right? You've got all of your notes, you've got the World Wide Web, you've got your books, um, all of that, right? Um, and two, you've got enough time that um, you should be able to complete this assignment um, in a timely kind of way if you're conscious about what your obligations are. Um, I laid this out, um, so for example, section test one will be um, posted to Moodle July 20th, 20th, <laughs> sorry, typo, that's funny, um, and due Monday, July 24th, so you've got four days with um, uh, that first one, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right, and that's kind of the minimum, you'll have minimally four days um, to engage with each of these tests. Um, should be straightforward. I uh, check email obsessively about this, so if you have questions, direct them to me, that sort of thing. Um, let me see, what else? I suppose we should do policies. First policy is plagiarism. Um, I'll just read it. This is the Oakland University Student Handbook, Policy on Plagiarism, Plagiarizing the Work of Others. Plagiarism is using someone else's work or ideas without giving that person credit. By doing this, a student is, in effect, claiming credit for someone else's thinking. It's theft. Um, whether the student has read or heard the information used, the student must document the source of the information. Uh, when dealing with written sources, um, a clear distinction should be made between quotations, uh, which reproduce the information from the source word for word, um, and uh, within quotation marks and paraphrases, which digest the source of the information in the student's own words. Both direct quotations and paraphrases must be documented, even as if, if a student rephrases, condenses, or selects from another person's work, the ideas are still that other person's, and failure to give credit constitutes misrepresentation of the student's actual work and plagiarism of another's ideas. This is the important bit. Uh, buying a paper or using information from the World Wide Web or Internet, love the redundancy, without attribution, and handing it in as one's own work is 
plagiarism. Um, I've had a lot of cases of plagiarism in the number of years that um, I have uh, taught for Oakland University. Um, this is, um, I'm in year 13 at Oakland University right now. Uh, I've been here a long time. So um, I've seen it all and I've got like a wacky knack for detecting plagiarism. Um, and uh, if, if there is a hill I'll die on, it is the plagiarism hill, right? Um, this is how it works. My job is to determine what you understand of this material and how well you are able to use language to describe abstract ideas and make arguments. That's my job. If I get a cut and paste off like a Wikipedia page or a cheathouse.com, that's, that's a source that I found a while back, um, et cetera, et cetera, like Spark Notes or something along those lines, I don't know how you did. I can't grade the assignment. So effectively, if it is not your work, I have nothing of value that I can actually submit a grade for. Right? On top of that, if it is not your work and you're trying to pass it off to as your own work, you're effectively trying to steal not only from the source that you've plagiarized, because that's theft, but you're trying to steal a grade from Oakland University. This is how my contract works. My contract says that I am an adequate judge of the quality of your work. I am not allowed to determine authorship. If I suspect plagiarism, there's an automatic process where it just goes to the Dean of Students office as an academic conduct case. I've had over 50 of these through the Dean's office. Right? Um, Sometimes I feel like I'm trying to stem a, 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 an unrelenting tide with this, but nonetheless, if there is one thing that it is, is important in terms of ensuring that students get an education that means something from Oakland University, and two, that you know the grade that you're getting is a fair grade, uh, you're also stealing from the other students in the class and devaluing their degrees if you get away with that. Anyhow, the point is uh, zero tolerance. All right? um, my contract says I've just got to pass you on to the Dean of Students office. So that's just, I, I need the job. I don't want to get fired. That's just what I do. All right? um, then on top of that, I've got um, a course policy for this, which is you fail. You know, if it's found that you plagiarized, if the uh, the dean's office determines through their committee that it is a case of plagiarism, in addition to whatever sanctions the dean's office decides to put on you for, for, for this offense, which can be substantial, all right? They could expel you from school, all right? Even if they decide to give you a little slap on the wrist, my policy is you failed the course. You've just failed. That's it. All right. So that's supposed to help you with your cost benefit analysis. <coughs> I'm not being mean. I'm just pointing out that this is what I need for from you in order to have you successfully complete this course. If you don't give it to me, you try to do an end run around this material. Well, there's nothing more to talk about. All right. Now, if you're worried about this, maybe this is your first university course, maybe maybe you don't take philosophy courses or writing intensive courses often. Um, what is plagiarism? How do I avoid it? How do I use citations properly? There's um, Notice I've got two footnotes, one for the, the Oakland policies and procedures, right, where I quoted the plagiarism policy from. Student handbook, you're responsible for it. Second footnote um, points out if you're unsure how to properly cite your work or what's required, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's the Cite Right program uh, through the Academic Writing Center. It's an online program, doesn't take too long, and it's actually quite useful. I've, I've used it, I've taken it, I've learned things from it. Um, and I give you a link to it there. All right. So um, that's also right on the assignment page for Moodle. You'll find a uh, hot link there. All right, that just takes you right to it. Um, 
Yeah, so if you don't know what plagiarism is and how to avoid it, here's how you determine what plagiarism is and how to avoid it. Um, here's the definition of plagiarism. Don't do it. Finger wag, finger wag. And this is the part of the intro lecture that I hate because you're probably very nice people. I don't know you from a hole in the ground yet. I've never met you. You've not submitted anything to me. You haven't done anything yet. But the issue of plagiarism makes me the angry cop that has to wag my finger at people before I even meet them. So effectively, I've just criminalized you and you haven't done anything. I don't like this. But um, th these policies in the policies section right, are all policies because I've had problems in the past. Right? So to a certain extent, I'm talking to the ghosts of students past, but um, and not necessarily you. Um, next policy, missed assignment policy. I know that life happens. Right? Sometimes the sky falls, um, that sort of thing. If this happens right around a deadline or due date, let me know, um, preferably before the deadline or the due date or within 12 hours, and we'll work something out, and I will move heaven and earth to get you through this class. If you're working with me, I'm working with you, all right? But if you don't let me know, I'll be unable to, you know, offer an extension. All right. Um, this, especially in a quick semester, we can't be going back to the first test in August, right? We just can't, we can't be doing that. Um, I've had fall semester courses where there's an end of September, beginning of October test, and somebody approaches me in December in order to take that test because they missed it. Uh, no, no, we've got to, we've got to stay on top of this material. Right. Um, and that kind of prep time for a student who missed an assignment is not fair to the students who were under a time crunch in order to. So basically, um, if life happens, you'll find that this is this is a heavy policy where I come down like a hard person kind of thing. Uh, but really, I'm quite friendly if you work with me and, and I will work with you. Um, assignment submission, you're uploading documents to Moodle. That's what you're doing. Um, so make sure, one, that the right document is uploaded to Moodle, two, that it actually uploaded to Moodle, um, and that's your responsibility. Right? Um, you have to hand me your assignment, otherwise I don't have it. Um, quick semester, lots of students. I don't have time to chase after you for your homework. Um, it, this is university education. You have to get it to me, right? That is your job. And then I have to get it back to you. That is my job. All right. Um, so it's your responsibility to um, submit, submit properly, submit the proper document. It's not your other class homework or a list of things to do on the weekend, but rather it's test one, two or three that you are uploading there. Um, and it's your responsibility to double check that your upload was successful. If I don't have it, it's not there. Right. I know I sound like a jerk, but I'm really not. I'm really a nice guy. All right. Um, email, um, I've already addressed this, um, but um, it, it's not instant. Uh, sometimes my emails back up a little bit. Um, I get a lot of them. I'm managing a bunch of email addresses. So um, doing my best right, to stay on top of it. Um, the one OU policy that's kind of weird is that technically if you email me from a Gmail account or a Comcast account or whatever, Hotmail, right? Um, does anyone use Hotmail anymore? It's sort of funny. I think I still have a Hotmail address somewhere. Um, it, it's, I'm not even supposed to reply to it. Your so all course correspondence is supposed to go through official university email address. So get those OU email accounts up and running. Um, it, this is also practical, pragmatic, because um, it, the OU uh, email account doesn't like accounts, email accounts that aren't OU. So every now and again, if it's from a Gmail, it'll just wind up in spam. I don't trust that your non-OU email will get to me. And on top of that, I'm not even supposed to respond to a non-OU email. So um, the, the university likes to own things is the thing. So um, let's, let's, let's keep it to the OU um, thing. Uh, already did the discussion uh, forum. 
content policy. And then finally, before you ask, there's no extra credit in this course. Okay? Extra credit is above and beyond 100%. And I, you know, it really, if you just do the assignments and stay on top of it, um, then um, you should be fine in this course. And I find extra credit helps those people that don't need extra credit. Um, Moodle's your hotspot. Um, you've got an email with this um, this video. Um, uh, you've got an email uh, with the syllabus. After that, it's your responsibility to check Moodle. Um, so everything is going to be up there. Stay up to date with the class. Um, I, I'm sort of crazy about putting important dates all over the place. So your important dates are on page three, and then there's a breakdown of your important dates on page four. And on page one, um, in terms of your test, there's another mention of three of the important dates right there. Um, uh, this is a tentative schedule, so um, the, like the email with the syllabus mentioned, um, week one, it's going to be the syllabus course policy and overview, overview and a general introduction to philosophy. Um, the, I've got a couple of videos. One, one is kind of old. Um, I've been meaning to re-record it, but you know, life happens, that sort of thing. Um, uh, the general introduction and pre-Socratics video, um, that's a little bit on the old side, but nonetheless, um, you'll get the point, the idea. This is sort of a precursor to what we're going to get into with Socrates next week. This is what you need to know in order to understand the kind of arc of ancient philosophy. Um, I do some general introduction to philosophy stuff there too and then there's a very short cartoony video called what's philosophy for that'll be up as well so um for the first week this video that you're towards the end of is um it, it's it, read the syllabus screen this video screen the other two videos and you're done for the week all right um, week two, uh, we're on to Socrates, um, and there's a list of readings from the five, five dialogues, the sections entitled Apology and Credo. Um, it, there's going to be a Socrates video, there's going to be a Rick Roderick Socrates video, um, and uh, there's going to be an Elaine de Baton video um, as well. Uh, guide to self-confidence i think it is it's he's this funny little british guy who um does this public philosophy stuff i like him um etc cetera, etc cetera. so that should be um fairly straightforward now uh the very last thing um that i'm going to point out to you is uh my letter grade to percentage point uh conversion here is probably not what you're used to but you're probably quite happy um, as you look at it. It's on page five of the syllabus. Um, the A range goes from 100 down to 80. The B range goes from 79.9 down to 70, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, it, you, you're probably quite happy about that, but um, understand at the same time, it's that much harder to get into the A range as it is. Um, and on top of that, this doesn't matter. Um, these letters to numbers are just sort of arbitrary. This is, you know, just what I grew up with. This is the Canadian standard sort of, um, this is, this is, if you've got an A minus, that means it's above 80, but, um, below 86, right? Um, that's, that's just what it means, um, institution by institution in Canada. Um, this is, um, sort of, you know, just, just what I think when I say this is an A, that's what I mean. This is a B. This is what it, conceptually I mean. It's what, what I'm used to. So I get to use whatever I want. This is it, so you know and don't freak out. When I give you a 77, you're thinking, oh, God, I've got a C. No, you've got a B. It's cool. All right. Um, what happens um, towards the end of the course and all the Office of the Registrar ever sees from me is a four-point grade. So um, I take the letter grade that you've earned based on the percentage of the course, and you've noticed everything totals 200. So it's really, really simple math. Right? Um, I, I get a grade out of 100 for you. I convert that to a letter grade. If you've got a B plus, I go down the uh, stage and I go, oh, that's a 3.5 and the Office of the Registrar gets a 3.5 from me for you.
All right. So um, that's that's assessment. Just so you don't freak out um, beforehand. I've 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 not pointed this out to students, and they have freaked out in the past. So now every semester, it's 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 um, in addition to my syllabus. So um, that's the course. If you have any questions um, about anything with regard to the course, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm around and uh, I check my email uh, now. Um, if you've been emailing before the course started, I, I usually kind of smoke bomb right, for about two months um, it, because I'm not on an act, active contract at Oakland University and I travel, I conference. I, I was in Toronto for a time, um, you know, I was in the Niagara region for a time, that sort of thing. I'm, I'm golfing, right, if you need me kind of thing. It's, it's my two months off, right, so I put the away message up on my email and away I go, but I'm back now. So um, if you need anything, let me know and um, I'm here at your disposal. So, um, yeah, all right. Have good days, one for each of you, and I look forward to an interesting semester.